A warm welcome to this edition of our environment show, Eco Africa. I am Sandra Twinobdia from Kampala here in Uganda. Of course, we'll also be covering the effects of the coronavirus pandemic in Africa. Here in Uganda, for example, the lockdown has led to the street side sale of newspapers to dry up. Many people are clearly staying at home and minimizing contact. Hello, Niota. How is the situation in Nigeria for you and, of course, the neighboring countries? Hi Sandra and hi viewers. A big hello from me in Lagos, Nigeria. Indeed, the pandemic is far from over here, I have to unfortunately say. But because people are staying at home, the use of cashless digital payment systems has risen by almost 15% in the last few months. I have a feeling that a lot of things are going to change here in Africa as a result of COVID-19. But here at Eco Africa, we will continue to focus on the important green themes Coming up this week, the environment needs volunteers to help more than ever nowadays. We'll meet two Kenyans doing what they can to assist. We meet an unusual environmental activist from Senegal. And we will introduce you to a species of antelopes in Ethiopia that had been hunted almost to extinction. He is famous on the streets of the Senegalese capital, Dakar, for his outlandish outfit and his single-handed campaign to raise awareness of the plastic waste problem. Children don't know whether they should laugh at him or be afraid when they see or meet the so-called plastic man, Modu 4. Coronavirus restrictions might be cramping his style a bit, but the environmental activist's work is paying off and he's determined to carry on the fight. I'd say this. Modufol has had to change tack in his fight against plastic waste. With the world in the grips of a pandemic, his only tool right now is his smartphone. But that's not likely to draw nearly as much attention. This is what usually looks like. Modu is Senegal's most renowned anti-plastic campaigner. For more than 15 years, he's been going around schools, neighborhoods and markets like this one in Dakar and swapping plastic bags for paper ones instead. While some people are put off by his unusual appearance, he usually gets his message across. <laughs> Hey, don't take these bags. I just want to show you the alternative. Stop plastic. Use this instead. He ties the plastic bags he gets to his suit to stop them from polluting the environment. Dakar, like many cities in the world, has a plastic pollution problem. Around 10% of Dakar's waste is plastic-based, and most of it ends up in the streets. Modufol doesn't hesitate to engage people in conversation. Medina Gunas sells tea. She's already switched to paper cups. Voilà. Medina explains that customers prefer drinking from them. She now stocked her shop with them. Even though they are more expensive, not all her customers want them, she says, but she thinks drinking from the paper cups is also safer. Through an association he heads, Modu wants to achieve a zero waste Senegal and help people find alternatives, such as making their own bags out of fabric, something that's relatively easy to do here. Everyone can do it. Go to the fabric stand and buy some fabric. Ask your tailor to make you a bag. When it gets a bit dirty, you can wash and reuse it several times. It's much better than using a plastic bag that took one second to make, 20 seconds to use, and will cause 400 years of pollution. Modu's passion for environmental protection began after he completed his military service. Returning to Dakar, he thought the city looked like a huge dump site. He had to take action. People thought he was crazy, including his family. But today his wife, Lisa, couldn't be prouder of what her husband has achieved. In the beginning, people would tell me he was crazy because the way he dressed up, and it really hurt me. And I didn't understand, but he was so passionate. Today I'm happy, so happy. Now I understand and I'm happy to see everyone is talking about my husband's work. In 2016, the country's president awarded him the National Order of Merit. 
Modu has also helped his community plant around 600 trees, according to the slogan, one house, nice. one tree. It's been a long campaign, but now many have come around to Modu's way of thinking. Even the government is getting serious about enforcing laws about single-use plastics. I'm not allowing myself to stop entirely, but I have to carry on the fight and push the authorities. There's still a lot to do. It could take another 20 years before we pick up all the types of plastic in the ground. And I'll be behind the youth, encouraging them to be an example. Once the coronavirus restrictions are lifted, Modu will be able to continue his work in earnest. In the meantime, perhaps the growing awareness of hygiene will go some way towards winning the battle against plastic waste. Munu Kofi has clearly got the plastic man's message when it comes to waste. He's an artist in Côte d'Ivoire whose work seeks to highlight just how many cell phones we've thrown away. He's already transformed thousands of them into artworks that have been shown in exhibitions in Africa and further afield. Now here's this week's Doing Your Bit. It's not easy to make a splash in the art scene, but Ivorian Monu Desiré Kofi has done it. His works are unique and arresting. And they give new purpose to discarded cell phones. I integrate old phones into my work to give them a second life and to draw attention to the fact that our lives are so intertwined with technology. We're so digitalized. That allows us to be connected, but we should also consider the environmental impact. Monu gets old phones from several sources. What he can't use, he passes on to recyclers. After breaking them up, he glues pieces onto canvases like mosaic tiles. In two years, Monu has used parts from around 24,000 phones. His works have made him a prominent contemporary Ivorian artist. And how about you? If you're also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. The amount of garbage produced here in Lagos hasn't really been reduced, despite all the many ideas and initiatives aimed at avoiding processing or upcycling waste. And it's not likely to get better with this pandemic. Is it, Sandra? Well, the coronavirus is certainly having an impact near to, although it's not all bad. In fact, here in Kenya's capital, Nairobi, there is actually more waste landing at the garbage dumps because with less traffic on the roads, the waste disposal trucks are getting through more easily. Is that good or bad for waste management? Eco Africa went to find out. <music> in the middle of a Nairobi residential area amidst the coronavirus lockdown. This waste dump is just one of many in and around Kenya's capital. Every day hundreds of tons of unsorted rubbish end up here, some of it highly toxic. People like Richard Kinyangu earn their living collecting and sorting the waste, but they live in fear of the coronavirus. There are 300 waste pickers here. If they touch contaminated waste, they won't wash their hands. They'll do it in the evening at home, but by then they'll have already contracted the disease. The volume of trash hasn't lessened despite the coronavirus lockdown. Nairobi's roads are less crowded right now. So the Municipal Waste Authority can deliver more waste to the dumps than before the crisis, some 3,000 tonnes a day. But the collectors aren't in any more danger than before, according to waste management official Ibrahim Otieno. Because of the lockdown, they might be required to get, leave the final disposal early uh, than normal. Uh, people that do waste picking, eh, they also become careful, they are using now gloves and PPEs. Eh. But the lockdown means there is less commercial waste reaching the dumps. 
meaning less valuable waste that can be recycled. And a lot of supermarkets have gone over to handing out disposable masks and gloves to their customers. Some of that lands on the dumps or on the streets. So the pandemic has increased the amount of medical waste. And that increases the risk of infection, says Daniel Paffenholz. He runs one of Kenya's few recycling operations. A lot of mouth masks, gloves, hand sanitizers, and that waste um, ideally should be kind of treated as more dangerous waste and should ideally be incinerated. So the government has been pushing a lot for that waste to be incinerated. So we're expecting that there'll be some legislative changes and basically stricter codes or uh, rules for how that kind of waste is generally managed. Cities like Nairobi were already struggling with massive environmental problems. The corona crisis has only made matters worse. Low- and middle-income areas don't even have waste collection systems in place. What is really needed is a complete shift away from that model and that ideally waste doesn't go to dump sites in the first place but goes to professional sorting sites. From there goes to various recycling, composting, biogas or other reuse or recycling um, mechanisms and then ideally then a dump site only is left to be used for about 5 to 10 percent of the waste that cannot be recycled. The authorities say that the massive catch-all dump sites are already on the way out. We have the Solid Waste Management Act uh, of 2015, we have EMCA Act uh, that talks about and the waste regulations uh, that guides on how waste management should be done. The only thing is now to enforce and ensure that people continue to be responsible on how they manage their waste. Nairobi resident Richard Kenyangu says it's not enough to rely on personal responsibility and government regulation, that the city's environmental problems need to be addressed more quickly. By the time the government identifies infected waste pickers as a source of danger, it'll be too late. And since the neighbourhood is growing anyway, they should close this dump site permanently. Until now, Nairobi's authorities have left the city's waste pickers largely unregulated. Now the city has two challenges to solve, the environmental problem and the coronavirus crisis. Many of you will never have seen or heard of a cocky. Hardly surprising as it is a very rare form of antelope. Cocky is what the animal is called locally in its native Ethiopia. In English, it is known as swan's hartebeest. In the 1990s, the subspecies were nearly hunted to extinction, but the local Oromo community banded together to ensure its survival, in part by following age-old clan traditions. Now the cocky population is bouncing back. This swain's hartebeest spends just a brief moment resting in the shade before seeking the safety of the herd. Swain's hartebeest are found only in Ethiopia. The largest population lives in the Senkele Sanctuary in the south of the country. An estimated 850 hartebeests live here. Almost 40 rangers tend to the antelope's safety and well-being. Chief Warden Desta Bedasso and his team want to keep the animals from going extinct. They are uh, categorized as critically endangered mammals in IUCN category. So they need special attention uh, to be conserved by the international community even so. Poachers used to be the biggest threat, but these days it's hyenas and jackals. Young antelope are especially at risk. The rangers have their work cut out for them and they patrol the sanctuary around the clock and will shoot an attacking predator if need be. Their dedication is paying off. This year, about half of the young antelopes survived. In the early 1990s, there were an estimated 3,500 hartebeests here. A year later, there were about 70. Poaching had become rampant, even though the traditional governing system of the Oromo people dictates respect for nature. To put an end to poaching, clan leaders agreed on strict penalties. The rangers help win local people over to the system. If anyone uh, caught poaching the heart beast, he will be punished as uh, he killed human being. 
So if someone kills the harvest, one harvest, he will be punished 100 cattles. But penalties alone are not enough to deter poaching. The antelope can only survive because the sanctuary benefits local people. They are permitted to harvest the dry grass that the antelope no longer need. It might not look like it, but the hay is a valuable resource. It's used in thatched roof, for example. Local communities earn the equivalent of about 180,000 euros a year from its sale. People benefit from the resources at Senkele by cutting the grass and selling it. Now the resource is being protected. Unlike in the past, when people used to build houses in the park. Over the years, the sanctuary has lost about a quarter of its land to farming an illegal settlement, leaving only about 58 square kilometers. That makes protecting the remaining harvest all the more important. When a small herd left the protected area in search of water, local people helped return the antelope to the sanctuary instead of hunting them for their meat. The sanctuary is a boom to all, both animals and people. Working here and protecting the heart of beast has benefited me a lot. I get a salary and I've been able to send my children to school with that salary. I have eight children and I've been able to send all of them to school. Nearly 40 species of mammal live here. But St. Keller Swain's heart of his sanctuary has never drawn large numbers of tourists. Now the coronavirus has put tourism on hold. Chief Warden Desta Badasso believes the crisis could open the door to a new form of travel. Nowadays the tourist number is not as such in, in, high num in good numbers as yeah. compared to the location of the sanctuary. Mm. So I hope the future of the, the sanctuary is bright as the world lives are focusing on the uh, nature-based tourism. As they wait for the visitors' return, the rangers continue to protect the animals day and night. Now, imagine building a house without using cement to make the concrete, but taking a substitute made of recycled raw materials instead. Sounds like a shoe in for an environmental magazine like Eco Africa, isn't it? And it is a process which a young man from Togo is working on in Switzerland with a partner. When the eco-concrete is market ready, it won't only be cheaper, it will also offer long-term climate protection benefits as well. Two men with one vision. Nyan Li Landro and Thibaut Demolin want to transform the construction industry with cement-free concrete. With support from businesses, they're constructing a display house. It's their first attempt to use the material in their ambitious project. It's kind of a an amazing feeling. Uh, we didn't sleep much uh, this this week. And it's good to say it. yeah. it's important <laughs> because it was a lot of work and uh, we are quite happy to see the results actually. Landro spent years researching cement-free building materials at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. Cement is responsible for 8% of worldwide carbon emissions. A more sustainable building material is long overdue. Landro found it on construction sites where every year millions of tons of clay-based excavation materials are disposed of. But when they're mixed with a naturally occurring mineral and water, they result in a construction material that's more environmentally friendly than standard concrete. Cement-free earth concrete is uh, up to 90% uh, CO2 reduction than com compared to conventional concrete. The uh, other advantage is that we don't use um, uh, like primary raw material that come from depletion like uh, gravel and sand uh, in, so, in, in uh, some areas in the world. Uh, but we use construction waste that are landfilled most of the time. 
And uh, the third part is the materials cheap to access, therefore like uh, reduce the price of the, the construction material. This earth concrete can be processed more or less like standard concrete, but at currently around half the cost. Nyali Landro was inspired by building practices in his home country. He grew up in Togo, where clay or earth houses are a common sight. In many countries in Africa, uh, cement houses uh, are kind of warm inside, therefore you need to have uh, a ventilation, a cooling system and stuff like this, whereas in earth house you don't necessarily need it. There's a demand for the cement-free concrete in industrialized nations, but also in countries where affordability is a priority, including in parts of Africa, where millions of new homes need to be built in the upcoming years. It's part of uh, our dream and our vision. So being able to implement technology as this in uh, Africa would be a huge uh, achievement for us. So enable people to have uh, affordable, safe, decent, and uh, same time uh, sustainable uh, accommodation. The display home is one step closer to fulfilling that dream. The quick drying walls will undergo further tests as the two scientists work to optimize their earth concrete. So earth concrete sounds like a good idea for the environment. Now let's take a look at another example for the change for the better. The Zanzibar archipelago in the Indian Ocean is in jeopardy as a result of climate change and the depletion of natural resources. Indeed, Sandra, like so many islands along this African coastline, but the community forest Pemba NGO is helping people adapt by planting trees, changing their farming methods and keeping bees. The results are impressive. We went to the tiny island of Kokota of the coast of Pemba Island to see for ourselves. Nowadays, it's difficult to make your way through the dense woodland in Kokota. Ten years ago, this land used to be barren. Activist Mbaruk Musa Omar and his NGO have brought it back to life. The organization encourages local communities to plant trees, install solar panels, build fuel-efficient cooking stoves and harvest rainwater. As a result, the Tanzanian island has witnessed a turnaround. Now the community is very well versed in the issue of tree planting. Some years ago, the people of Kokota used slash and burn farming methods, leading to massive deforestation. Most rivers and the groundwater ran dry. What was once fertile soil turned to dust and people had to import food. The organization has planted over 680,000 fruit trees and forest trees in Kokota. To make sure that the reforestation is successful, local communities regulate felling. Among the people benefiting are beekeepers. The trees provide bees with a well-protected and shady dwelling place and a source of food when they're flowering. Two years ago, Saloum Kasim had just two beehives. Now he has 75. I can't do anything without the forests. When you hang the hives like we've done here, we get best quality honey. It's clean and the bees can't be attacked by other insects. Kokota is now on the road to recovery. But the islet of Nujau, just a couple of kilometers away, is still in dire straits. Like Kokota in the past, Njau has no clean drinking water and the land is degraded. This tree planting event is designed to help the islanders understand the importance of trees. We encourage them and help them in planting as well. Then when the rains come, we work together with the communities when we visit them and plant trees in their areas for the purpose of ongoing conservation. The organization's activities are funded by the European Union. 
The aim is to enable communities to become self-sufficient by means of agribusiness. We've come to the end of this week's Eco Africa, which featured an inspiring mix of small initiatives, big projects and dedicated people. I am Sandra Trinobdio. Please do keep safe and join us next week. Goodbye. Thanks for staying with us, even during the corona era. The number of infections appears to be on the increase in many African countries. And just remember, when you protect yourself, you also protect your environment. A heartfelt goodbye from me as well in Lagos, Nigeria, and do stay healthy. See you again.